thank you all for being here once again. Uh, the series this year, uh, because the organizer is a little disorganized, it's a little behind schedule and getting things scheduled. Uh, so we have uh, right now just two on our calendar if you've been to the website. We have a second talk coming up in April, uh, in, on April 15th, and we're working on a third talk, which will either be two weeks before or two weeks after that. But problems right here. So, oh yes, and I'm Scott Carney, uh, your usual series organizer with my friend and partner in crime, Andy Singer. We're both professors here in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, if you have any questions about the university, the college, or the department, we'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. Uh, but today, we have a really exciting talk about drones and data, and my friend Andy is going to introduce our speaker. So, Andy, it's all yours. Thank you. <laughs> so as Scott said, uh, there's a really exciting opportunity here. Uh, Mani Gopavar is a professor in civil and environmental engineering and also in computer science. And he's a, a great example of products of this university. He has a master's degree in computer science and a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from our department here on campus. Um, and he really has uh, uh, put together an amazing collection of research ideas uh, and concepts uh, that combine uh, data, visualization, and construction in whole new directions that he, if you go to his website, you will see he's won more awards than I could possibly name in the hour that we've got allotted here. Uh, what I'm really excited about is uh, he is a faculty entrepreneurial fellow um, in the College of Engineering, which basically says that as a professor, he gets to come to work and work on ideas around technologies that will change the future in a way that will create new companies. And he's the founder of a company called Reconstruct, which uses many of these ideas that involve data analytics, that involve drones and construction projects. So I don't want to hold up Monty anymore. Please give a round of applause for Monty Gopal. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andy, for your introduction. Good morning. Um, I'm very excited to be here Saturday morning. I'm excited to see so many people, so I appreciate your time. And um, within the next uh, 45, uh, 50 minutes, uh, I would like to introduce you to the concept of visual data analytics for project controls on construction sites. Specifically, visual data that will be captured with drones. So you actually see an example of that in the background of the screen, which happens to be from McCormick Place construction project in the city of Chicago. Before actually getting to the details of the technology, I think it would be helpful if I touch on a number of issues with respect to construction. How many of you have, um, are working in construction or have families that are working in construction? All right, a few. Excellent. Uh, so last year was a really exciting year for construction. The value put in place exceeded $1.1 trillion. And the growth rate has been expected to be somewhere around 9 to 10 percent. Now, if you start thinking about how much money is planned to be invested in infrastructure projects, highways, mining sites, uh, refinery plants, uh, you would see that the uh, investment is expected to be doubled within the next 15 years. As much as uh, you know, these numbers are really exciting, when it comes to our performance, uh, we have a lot of uh, room for improvement. Um, McKinsey & Company uh, is a company that does consultancy and analysis of various industries in the U.S., put out a report last summer that shows shocking numbers with respect to how we're performing our construction projects. If you look into the projects that we have right now in the U.S., 98% of our projects, almost all of them, are behind the schedule and exhibit cost overruns. How much are they behind the schedule? About 20 months when it comes to mega projects, and mega projects are any projects that are larger than a billion dollar. So you can think about the stadium project, you can think about a high rise project, you can think about a high highway project. And when it comes to cost, increase could be as much as 80% from what we originally planned to perform that project. These numbers are not limited to our mega projects. It is also happening on our building sites, commercial buildings, industrial buildings, uh, buildings that we actually do on campus. I'm proud to say I've actually been involved in construction of the Eikenberry Dining Hall on campus. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, can you say that loud again, please? Excellent. Uh, so the question is, are there any penalties for potential you know, um, delays or cost overruns? Absolutely. Um, that penalty could be with respect to time performance of the project. That could be with respect to cost. So if you bear with me for a moment, I'm actually going to show you an owner's perspective on these performance uh, issues. Uh, but when it comes to actual projects, 
billing projects, more than 50% of the projects that we currently perform in the US are behind the schedule. Now, there was a study done last summer on how owners see performance. Does it make sense for us to keep project on schedule, to finish it on time? Does it make, make sense for us to keep it on cost, quality, safety, design, and the experience of the users? Interestingly enough, owners actually identified project schedule, time performance, to be the most important one. Why? Because in our contracts, there are creative ways that we can establish penalties for making sure that the contractors can finish the project on budget. But when it comes to, co when it comes to time, uh, we don't have too much control on how the contractors will be able to perform the project. So again, adherence to project schedule has been most highly valued. Now, what are the factors that are leading to these poor performance problems? Number one is inadequate communication on job sites. We have a lot of parties that get engaged in a project, and when it comes to owners, contractors, and subcontractors, it's hard to have them on the same page in terms of how much progress is being achieved on the job site on a daily basis. Over the years, we've enhanced our technologies that we're using for the purpose of tracking progress. We started by asking our subcontractors to re uh, send us reports on a daily basis. Over time, we tried to bring in new technology to improve the process. But still, if you walk into a construction trailer, the first thing you're going to see is that drawings are hung on, on the wall, and you see people walking around and color coding how much progress they actually make on a daily basis. So from the time that the problem happens to the pro time that the project manager learns about that problem, we've effectively lost one week of work. So you can see that you know, it obviously leads to flawed performance monitoring. The biggest problem we have is that it's really hard for us to understand how much work we can actually do on a short-term basis. Companies have actually been able to enhance their uh, abilities to predict what could be done in a year from now, in two years in terms of planning. But when it comes to us really understanding weekly progress, daily progress, there's so much uh, room for improvement. And the biggest problem is typically the people that we engage in the process of planning, understanding how much subcontractors can achieve, are not the ones that are actually on the job site. They don't get a chance to walk around the job site, see how much progress is happening. So that feedback on the reality of the job site to the plan is always uh, missing. Uh, now, given these problems, uh, we wanted to see if we can design a system, uh, work on concepts that can actually address a problem from a uh, you know, uh, broad perspective. So we created a project control system that takes advantage of visual data images, videos that could be captured, for example, with a drone to offer analytics that are meaningful for construction projects. So we have a system that takes in these images and can automatically give you a 3D picture of how much work has been expected to be done on the job site, what is the reality of the job site, be able to compare the two, and areas, locations, tasks, or subcontractors behind the schedule to be color coded in red, areas that are on the schedule to be color coded in green. Beyond um, just tracking what the problems are, we also have data analytics that can predict the future of the project. We can actually predict how, plan, uh, how, how much uh, reliable our plan is and be able to bring it into coordination meetings so we can have all of our subcontractors sit in the meeting, the superintendent will be guiding that team to understand what is the risk in terms of the project execution and address these problems. So effectively, our system has ability to help them address problems before they happen on the job site. So I mentioned about visual data. Why visual data and why in 2017 we have to be looking into it? Over the past few years, there's been a significant growth in terms of how many images and videos we are capturing on the job site. So we thought, what if we just tap into these existing data and see if we can actually use it for the purpose of project controls? We had two goals. One, to see if we can take images and videos. And you know, if you walk on the job site, everyone has a smartphone. They can easily capture photos. They can easily understand um, you know, how much progress is being achieved um, um, from a photo. So the idea was to capture reality, provide that as a feedback to our teams, and make sure there's always a layer of verification that will be provided to the team in terms of uh, how much progress is being achieved. Now, today there are six types of visual data that we capture on the job site. Uh, pictures that subcontractors capture. So you walk around the job site, you look into the site, from a quality perspective, from a progress perspective, from a productivity perspective, you take pictures. Um, you know, typically we have somewhere between 200 to 1,000 photos that are being usually captured. The job sites that are larger, we bring other companies, they walk around the job site, they perform professional photography. Uh, within 24 hours, they come back and they actually show us where images are captured with respect to a model. We place time-lapse cameras. How many of you have seen time-lapse cameras? Great. So we put these uh, cameras to make sure we can actually track progress. 
using action cameras is also becoming common. GoPro cameras, you know, smartphone video cameras, walk around the job site and videotape it. Drones have been you know, a, a, a significant opportunity for us. Um, this is perhaps one of the uh, very few examples of technology very rad rapidly being adopted on job sites. Uh, we are seeing you know, somewhere close to about 2,000 images that are being captured on job sites by flying a drone over that specific site. So you're actually looking to McCormick Place. Now we also have other technologies that we use for data capture. An example of that is a laser scanning device, which is a little bit more expensive, so the frequency of the capture would be uh, you know, less. But all in all, we have all kinds of visual data that provide us with an opportunity to see how much progress is being achieved on the job site. So I want to start by specifically focusing on drones. And I want to actually show you one of the um, educational partners that we have, a company that manufactures drones. And I want to kind of show you what are the capabilities of these commercially available drones and what kind of cameras they can uh, you know, carry. So I'm going to play this video for you. This is the latest uh, um, drone that was uh, um, commercialized uh, just a few weeks ago. DJI's most rugged, reliable, and versatile commercial aircraft to date. Forged by the hands of our top drone engineers, it wields an array of functionality for enterprise users who demand tools that exceed expectations. A newly designed dual battery power system supports up to 32 minutes of flight for maximum airtime with a single gimbal. State-of-the-art aerial imaging is yours for the taking through native support of DJI's industry standard gimbal technology. Load it up with the Zenmuse X4S, X5S, you see the camera that carries? Camera, or the XT thermal imaging platform. With an onboard FPV camera, Pilots have a real-time view in front of the aircraft to navigate confidently through complex environments. When it comes to gathering critical intel, two eyes in the sky is better than one. The Matrice 210 gives you the power of mounting two gimbals at once. Maximize efficiency by flying two cameras side by side for capturing different types of image data at the same time. You can now mount a camera on top of the aircraft for inspecting vital infrastructure in all those hard to reach places. For rough weather, we've added IP43 ingress protection that shields your aircraft from the elements. The M200 was born to traverse rugged terrain thanks to its compact foldable design. So you're hitting the sky within minutes of arriving on site. Two batteries provide power redundancy that ensures reliable operation in a wide range of environments, and a self-heating function keeps them operating even in sub-zero temperatures. With DJI's flight autonomy system, most concerns about safety and reliability are a thing of the past. An upward-facing time-of-flight laser sensor recognizes objects above the aircraft. Stereo vision systems detect obstacles down below and in front of the aircraft. The M200's ability to sense and avoid obstacles makes close proximity inspections faster, easier, and safer. With the Matrice 210 RTK, your aircraft gains centimeter level positioning accuracy thanks to DJI's DRTK GNSS High Precision GPS technology. DRTK also boasts resistance to magnetic interference for commercial flight missions near large metal structures and electromagnetic fields. The DJI Matrice 200 series. High performance aircraft with the reliability and versatility fit for any mission, no matter how tough. All right, so you saw a little bit of our commercial uh, with respect to this uh, drone manufacturer. Well, as you can see, um, it can operate for a little bit over 30 minutes. And the good news is that it actually operates on um, construction sites too. So I want to show you an example of operating this on a job site. Uh, this is with one of our partners a little bit over a year and a half ago um, in Florida. And um, the video is a little bit choppy. I couldn't make it uh, work better right now. But uh, basically, you're looking at a concrete placement operation. Uh, this is half a million dollar operation that happens within 90 minutes. So from the time that any of these concrete trucks show up in the job site 
to the time that we can place that concrete, we only have 90 minutes. So it's really important for us to figure out a way that we can properly coordinate the task and make sure we keep our people safe and the process uh, productive. The uh, video looks a little bit choppy, but um, you can actually see 30 concrete trucks, three pumps, two tire cranes that are simultaneously working. That means about 200 workers are probably engaged in the task of placing concrete uh, during the time that the video is being captured. Um, so this is a great opportunity for us to use these uh, you know, uh, visual sensing devices that we have to capture progress. But in the meantime, in construction, we've been able to enhance our ability to plan for construction. So it's actually pretty common for us now to create these types of animation that shows how much progress is expected to be done. This is with one of our partners, Mortensen, uh, construction company, and you can actually see the timeline of the project with a date, and it actually shows you with different colors in terms of how much progress is being uh, expected to be done. You see the work, you see the locations with respect to the crane, so you can use it for safety planning, you can use it for tracking progress, measuring productivity, um, and also um, uh, looking to the site logistic. So the idea that we've had is to see how we can combine these two uh, different sources of information, the ones that we have from a uh, um, drone perspective and the ones that we have from a planning perspective. The ones that I just showed you with respect to animation, they can actually show us how much work is expected to be done, let's say on a weekly basis. The ones that we have with the drone can actually provide us with the reality of the job site. We can compare plan versus reality and generate these visual production models that will show us what is expected uh, versus actual on the job site. So what do we do uh, with respect to the capture process? Before we bring these drones on our job sites, before we let people walk around the job site, we, know, we need to go through a process of making sure that the operation is safe. So gladly enough, um, through the work that we've done at the university, we've been able to establish a number of national guidelines for safety operation of drones on construction sites. These are checklists that we provide uh, people that are on the job site, so they're all being informed that the drone is being operated. So there are elements of safety, procedures for the person who operates the drone, what is the responsibility of the client, the owner of that job site, what are the responsibility of the workers when they see the drone is operating around, and also the superintendents that we have on the job site. Once we actually go through this process of safety, we go through a process of planning. That means we get access to the maps available from that job site, we create a grid, we exactly know how much time is expected to us to fly a drone. Typically it takes somewhere between 10 minutes to you know, about an hour, but in this case it was a smaller job site, so you see about 8 minutes flying over 7 acres of land. Um, and it can actually produce a really high quality maps for us. Once this process of planning is done, we send our drone operators to job sites. Uh, this is McCormick Place. Uh, this actually was um, um, typically conducted Saturday mornings, close to 6 a.m. Uh, for a little bit over a year, uh, where our drone operator was showing up and was basically capturing these type of uh, visual shots for us. So this is uh, last March, about a year ago, and the goal was to make sure when he's flying over the job site, given the plan that we've provided to him, he can capture changes from the last time that he's been on the site, um, and obviously this requires us to, to go through some uh, coordination process. So I want to show you a number of these videos. This is one that was captured in uh, March. Um, you see another one here um, a week after. So basically every week, every Saturday, he was showing up, flying over the job site, and providing with visuals. They can see pretty much everything that is happening on the job site, where your uh, work is happening, what are the concrete elements that are being placed, uh, where the cranes are. So you get a very good feel for um, everything that is happening around the site. Uh, these um, operations do not necessarily need to be fly over the job site. They can also be around the structure. Um, and I don't know if this video is going to play. But if not, basically this video was showing the structure um, from the site. So we can have all kinds of uh, captures uh, that are meaningful. At the end of the day, from these captures, we extract snapshots, images from various locations. So you can actually see the site from you know, an upper elevation. You can see the areas that are specifically focusing on the task. Now, once these visual data is being captured by the drone operator, they are typically provided to us um, through a web-based system that we have, and we use them for the purpose of generating 3D models on the job site. So what is the process? We've created engines based on the research that we've done at the university, um, research on computer vision, that's the study of images and videos, that takes in these two-dimensional data that we have and transforms it into 3D models that we can extract location information from anything that is happening on the job site. 
So once these images are uploaded, this is an example of these reality models. You're looking at the site completely in 3D in a web-based environment. This is where one of those images were being captured. So I can take you to that camera viewpoint. You can see the site. I can show you that image that was captured with respect to the 3D model that we've generated. You can change your viewpoint. You can see the image. You can see the point cloud. And now you can start doing measurement. Without being on the job site, you can measure length. You can measure areas, you can measure volumes, you can create cross sections, things that you know, civil engineers, construction managers really want to understand when it comes to quality and safety. Now, we obviously wanted to do this over time, so we created a number of uh, systems that every time we fly generates one model, it automatically brings these models into alignment. So I, we call them 4D reality, 3D plus time. Um, basically, at the bottom of the screen, you see a timeliner has um, a number of ticks. Every tick represents one day in our project. So you can actually see these orange dots. Each of them represents one of the reality models that we've generated on this job site. So let me advance that for you. So you can actually see from these simple images how we can automatically generate these reality models and keep doing them over time. So this is completely changing how we perform our surveying practice a drone platform that can cost just a few hundred bucks is flying over this job site and in a matter of hours we can generate these models that can bring complete transparency in terms of how much work uh, can be done on the job site. What it also does for us is that it organizes all of the images that we capture based on location and time. You see these are small pyramids? Each of them is one of the images that have been actually captured on this job site. So you can actually dive yourself into any of these camera viewpoints get access to the photograph and see the site and do your measurement from that camera perspective. In a moment, you're going to see that the user changes um, the camera perspective, goes into a different viewpoint. So now you can, for example, study progress that's happening on the north part of this uh, higher structure in Chicago. Uh, we've been able to deploy this technology on many different types of sites. Um, you see an example with our Japanese partners. Uh, this is a dam project. Uh, this is another commercial building um, in Chicago. Uh, we've actually been operating on a number of stadiums in the US. This is uh, Sacramento Kings Stadium, half a billion dollar project in California. And more recently, we've been inv involved in a project of uh, tracking performance of bridges. And this example happens to be also in Japan. Now, this is only one part of our process, which takes in the images and generates reality model. If you want to use them for the purpose of progress tracking, you need to compare plan versus reality. So how do we bring planning to the picture? There are two strategies. Uh, we've been uh, part partnering with the Department of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering, as also Department of Computer Science, to design these tags that you see on the screen. We place these tags around the job site. And these tags are being automatically detected by the algorithms that we have and can help us bring these 3D plan models that we have into alignment uh, with the reality. There are ways you can do this automatically, and there are ways that you can do this uh, semi-automatically. But what it really does for us is that now that you have the reality model of the job site created, this is that stadium project I was mentioning earlier, now you can also see that plan model overlaid on top. The 3D plan shows you how much contractor is expected to perform, and the reality shows what is really happening on the job site. We've been able to, again, do this on various types of projects. Uh, McCormick Place, so you see how much is expected to be done versus reality. This is actually another project in Arizona, the stadium project that I showed in California. This also happens to be in Los Angeles, a healthcare facility uh, that we are currently tracking progress on that site. Now, we've shown the plan, we've shown the reality, we need to start comparing. I'm not going to get into too much details here, but basically the idea is that Companies that actually plan for the construction activities uh, would help us create these animations in our web-based environment. At the bottom of the screen, you see another marker at the bottom of this uh, timeline that shows you what is expected to be done. So you see the user is advancing. Here there's a you know, tooltip that shows you the date. And if you watch the animation, you can see we can uh, study how much progress is planned to be conducted on this job site. So you have the reality, you have the expectation, and you can start comp comparing the two uh, for the purpose of uh, progress tracking. So now the point cloud comes back into our picture. So reality versus uh, plan uh, could be aligned. The user is changing the viewpoint in time. So now we are advancing ourselves to another point in time and studying the progress from that perspective. All right, so once we have the plan, once we have the reality, what can we do with it? The first thing that we do is we actually visualize who is expected to do what work in what location every single day. 
So every single worker that shows up on the job site walks into the trailer, looks into this larger screen that we have in the trailer, and shows what are the tasks that are responsible for so we can minimize how much time we spend on communicating um, 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 the work that is expected to, to be performed on the job site. We can also start tracking actual progress. We use a metaphor of traffic light colors. So areas that are behind the schedule every day can be color coded in red. Areas that are on the schedule could be done um, in green, as an example. So it can really bring transparency for owners, for public, for contractors in terms of how much progress is being achieved. Now, once we measure actual reality, we also have a number of techniques that can actually predict risk in the future. Uh, but you know, over time, we've actually learned a number of things. One thing that we've learned is that we, when we start color coding progress, if you keep doing this, there's a chance that a few companies that are typically behind the schedule will always be singled out in the meetings that we participate. So to bring the element of collaboration, one idea we had is to group together areas that are problematic into locations. So we have this risk assessment that we perform to make sure we are not you know, presenting problems of one company. Rather, we are helping them all collaborate to add those problems that are uh, happening with respect to the future of the project. Now, how do we go by implementing this process? There are two ways that you know, companies can take advantage of this for weekly coordination process and for what, you know, coordination that happens every day, which we typically call that daily huddles. Uh, so I'm going to show you some examples from one specific project. Uh, this is McCormick Place uh, in the city of Chicago, um, $625 million project. Uh, we were involved for a little bit over 10 months. Drone was being operated. Uh, we were generating all these visuals for the purpose of uh, tracking progress. So we work with the company to make sure everybody's on the same page on how the system would be used. I'm not going to get into the details, but we establish responsibilities. Which company is going to be involved in the process of planning? Who's going to show up to capture the pictures with the drone? Who's going to do the analysis, which was really us? Who's going to update their plan based on the information that we provide so they can repeat this every single week uh, without having any problem uh, through a systematic process? Now here's an example of how the company was actually using our system. Uh, so you see the superintendent uh, was putting the system on a larger screen, documents were being printed off from the system, and he's actually addressing problems location by location. So on the top of the screen, you see five snapshots. Each of them is a location that carries risk. He engages all of the subcontractors in a conversation on how we can address potential performance problems in the future and make sure we can keep our projects uh, on budget and on schedule. Now, drones can mostly operate outdoors. So what do we do when it comes to indoors? Can we start bringing them inside the building and then start operating them? So we needed to come up with a strategy for uh, indoor capture. Our idea was really simple. It's too early for us to commercially operate drones because there's so many elements associated with you know, flying these um, on the job site, the elements of safety, making sure there's no collision with respect to the structure that we have. So we decided to adapt a very simple strategy. Use the smartphones, use 360 cameras that companies have, have them hold these devices, and the cost of them is uh, really minimal. They, they cost somewhere between 300 to 500 for a project that is half a billion dollars. So you see there's not um, a whole lot of uh, cost associated with the device. We come up with a plan. We let these guys start with the location, videotape their path around the job site so we can actually make sure we can do a proper um, indoor reality modeling. So I'm showing you an example of this on the project. Again, this is a video-based capture. To make sure e every worker would be able to perform this for us, we provide guideline that is completely visual. What to do with a video camera and what not to do with a video camera when it comes to recording. You see there are some markers that we have in the scene. These markers would actually help us make sure that the capture is complete and we can actually generate proper reality models. Once we have these videos created, I'm going to show you what happens in the back of the scene. In our system, we have ability to detect what we call features from that video, and we can start mapping these features in a three-dimensional environment. Every one of these dots that you see on the screen happens to be a point um, in, in 3D. And over here, the green line is showing you the path of the movement, and these um, pyramids that you see here are locations uh, where the user is walking around and videotaping. So a, a, uh, you know, a floor on this building that is somewhere around 100,000 square foot could be actually captured over a few minutes. I'm going to advance this. So you see the user actually comes back and we'll be able to close the loop and we can get a complete capture associated with that location. So now in a fashion we've added the problem of indoor capture. 
Now you can actually start generating the same reality models that I showed you from outside, but now this time for inside using a consumer grade camera, and you can map it into that location on that high res structure, um, how much work is actually being done. Now beyond also ability to create these models, I earlier showed you that people you know, already capture photos. So how do we manage their photos and make sure those are also being aligned? Not every worker on the job site has ability to work with these three-dimensional models. So we decided to also come with a 2D interface that shows construction plans, and that's very normal. What we do is we actually create these hot spots that you know, workers know that they have to go to these locations, and when they're done, they will be taking photos. So basically, they walk into any location. They will be using the app that we have, and they will take a picture from ceilings, from walls, floor, any element that uh, is within the site um, and, and, and work is actually happening. Um, they can actually annotate these photos. So you see an example of it over here. You're actually using a technology from Google that has the ability to transcribe voice. So you can talk to the device, and it automatically creates comments. So it also streamlines the process of reporting that the contractors typically go through. What it now happens is that these intentional photos that the subcontractors are also capturing can also be automatically aligned with models that we have. So I'm showing you all the mechanical, electrical, plumbing components. Now you have ability to see the reality uh, versus how much uh, work is expected to happen for indoors. So everything I've shown you so far is just to show you that you can go ahead and take advantage of uh, visual data on job sites and transform them into what we call actionable data uh, that you can use it for uh, project controls. It had three elements. The element that manages your visual data, integrates it with the plan, and the elements that does the analytics and can predict risk with respect to the future. So what are the benefits that we get from this? Everything I've shown you is completely visual. Owners, contractors, subcontractors, they're all on the same page in terms of how much progress is happening. So we like to call that a transparent process view. Our system brings transparency in terms of actual performance on the job sites. It tracks costs. So now you can make sure you can uh, have opportunity to reduce the cost. We show the problems on the job site, so you can use the system for quality controls. Uh, we can uh, potentially use this for safety uh, on the job site and really brings transparency and uh, realism to the total cost and duration. It's a system that is being used by everyone on the job site, from the workers to the managers to the owner, and we see this as an opportunity to bring a win-win situation for all parties that are engaged in the project. So what are the other things that are happening? Um, things that are still at the uh, development uh, mode at the university that have not been commercialized. One uh, is this ability to also expand this into inspecting uh, status of existing infrastructure systems. So this is uh, with one of our partners in Japan. And um, these Japanese are actually visiting us on Monday from the Ministry of Land and Transport. There's a total of 700,000 bridges in Japan, actually a little bit higher than what we have in the US, which is close to about 650. Shocking, a smaller country like Japan has more bridges than us. But basically the idea is to minimize the cost associated with bridge inspection. So you'll be flying a drone on the job site, you can capture the visual data, you can have bridge engineers that will be sitting at their office, they will go through these visuals that we have, they would attach their inspection reports into any given location, you can download them, you can update them, and over time, using the timeliner, you bring transparency and consistency in terms of monitoring uh, critical infrastructure systems. Now, when I showed you the color coding of the elements, um, not everything that is commercially useful right now is automated. Um, at the university, we're working on a number of uh, technologies that can actually automatically assign these colors. So basically, there's no need for superintendents to worry about the accuracy of the data they're getting. We will provide them with the data, so now they can start spending their time on improving project performance as opposed to analyzing uh, data. Um, the process of um, flying drones, what I showed you earlier, was completely based on a 2D map. You fly over the job site autonomously, and you can do the capture. We are working on a technology that can actually transform this process to be 3D. So I'm going to show you an example of that. It's very simple. We show what are the areas that are subject to be changed on a job site. So imagine this is how much progress is expected to be done. And a drone operator is logged into the system. The drone operator would be able to place cameras. So this is the camera viewpoint of the drone. In a moment, you're going to see that um, drone operator would start placing camera. We just placed one. I'm going to advance this a little bit. You see the flight uh, would be created. It would be simulated. And before drone is actually operated on the job site, we can color code elements whether this drone operation would actually capture every single thing that is happening on the job site. 
So you can guarantee that the drone operator will show up on the job site within 15 minutes, everything is done. And you don't need to bring this person back on the job site to do another one because the data capture was not complete. Now, what would happen for indoors? We still want to do automation. So this is actually work that has been in partnership with Professor Tim Bredel um, last year. And we had 18 students involved um, in the task, which was to design this autonomous ground robot that you manually operate for the first time. A superintendent would make it walk around the job site. It would learn the map of the scene. And every single day after 5 PM, when the workers are gone, would start maneuvering around the job site, would capture all images and videos that um, you know, we want to get on the job site. Um, the technology is something that we've created. Um, it's something that we've tested in lab settings. It's not something that we've actually transferred into any of our job sites. There's so many social aspects with respect to operating a ground robot when you have workers on the job site that are still not worked out. But the opportunity, again, is that you don't have to worry about the process of capture. This thing would move around and would be able to capture. So you can actually see the cameras that we have on top of it. Now I want to show you also one more work um, that we've done with partnership of uh, the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. This is with Professor Seth Hutchinson, Sun Cho John, and Professor Tim Bredel, a project that's been sponsored by uh, National Science Foundation. The platforms that we are currently using, um, you know, the DJI um, commercial platform that I showed you, has a lot of room for operating on the job site. But we have areas that maneuvering these drones would be pretty challenging. So one idea that we've had is to look into a robotic bat um, this is actually uh, the piece of work that's been done by Professor Hutchinson and Chan, so I've not been involved in it. Uh, the part that I'm going to be involved in it is to take this and transform it into something useful for construction projects. So you see the elements of um, uh, the, uh, the wings on the bat. Uh, it has the ability to be really agile. It can perch surfaces, so it can pick objects, it can place objects for us on the job site. So it brings a lot of uh, maneuverability that we currently don't have with these quadcopters um, that you, you can purchase with a few hundred bucks. I'm going to advance this so you can actually see how this flies around. Uh, there you go. But really the credit goes to them um, for creating the uh, technology behind it. Um, and again, the idea is to um, use this as a next step for bringing um, robotic platforms to job sites and help them with uh, placement of work. Now, everything I've shown you so far, uh, there's an army of talented people who are working on it. So I would like to start by people on campus that have contributed to intellectual properties and technology, a group of students from various departments, uh, civil and environmental engineering, computer science, and uh, electrical and computer engineering. They're all working on the core foundation of the technology, once we create the technology, we still involve our students through the support that we received from Technology Entrepreneurship Center at a startup company at Enterprise Works. Uh, so now the prototypes can actually be transformed into software applications that construction companies can use. Um, this, um, this is actually in partnership with Professor Derek Hoem and Professor Tim Bredel in Computer Science and Aerospace Engineering Department and an army of very talented students that are working on software engineering these solutions and transforming into um, um, tools that people can use on job sites. Um, this project has been uh, with funding and help of many uh, organizations. I want to quickly acknowledge all the parties that are providing the funding for this research. Uh, National Science Foundation on, through a number of grants from hardware pieces to the software pieces to the elements of construction. Uh, we've been fortunate enough that we've been receiving grants from Intel, NVIDIA for the hardware pieces that we're using. Companies like Caterpillar that are in town working closely with us to bring this into construction equipment and many construction companies. Uh, they've been providing us with the data that we wanted to make sure we can use it for prototyping the system. I also want to acknowledge our facilities on campus that owns and operates all of our facilities. They've been also very instrumental in helping us um, fly these drones on our campus and make sure we can use them for educational purposes. Uh, by that, I would like to uh, wrap up the presentation and open up for questions. Thank you. That's an excellent point. So the, the question is, 
uh, it often seems to be that companies are over uh, optimistic in terms of how much work they can do. Um, is that something that we take into account? You know, one of the biggest challenges that companies have is collecting actual data from their job sites. Um, understanding how much work could be done per worker is something that companies are not good at because that data basically doesn't exist today. And what I mean by that is how many cubic yards of concrete could be placed on a weekly basis. The opportunity here is we use our system because it's all visual and because we actually track workers that are working on these locations, we can actually collect this data and provide as a feedback so for their future projects they can use realistic data as opposed to optimistic data when it comes to planning. But I mean, um, there are also elements of our competition. We have public bid for a lot of projects, so there's always a pressure of making sure uh, you provide a solution that can keep the project um, you know, in, in accordance to what the owner is expecting. So there's a fine balance there, but the data here can actually bring a lot of transparency to that process. Yes? Are there any FAA regulations on drones that limit where and how you can use your drones? Absolutely. That's an excellent question. Yes. So FAA, um, over the past few years, have established a number of regulations. It has started by you know, requiring um, a, a 333 exemption to operate on job sites. Basically, what that meant is that you need to have an actual pilot, the pilot that operates uh, you know, commercial planes or helicopters as part of a team that operates drones. Uh, so we started working with those companies that actually had these permits. Every single operation that I showed you so far on these sites have actually been done by these professional people as opposed to the students that have been on campus. Last year, with the uh, interest in drones and their operation on job sites, FAA started changing regulations. So there's something called Section 107 that they can apply to. And you go through a training process that actually, in the city of Champaign, we have a location that offers that. And off of that, you can get a license to start commercially operating drones. Uh, so in our team, we do have two students who've gone through that exam. And now they can actually commercially operate drones even on our own campus. Uh, for the purpose of projects that we do. Um, still, um, all these regulations are only within um, you know, certain areas within the city. Um, a lot of cities, a lot of different uh, states are coming up with their own regulations, so things are really dynamic when it comes to operation. The most challenging ones are when you're close to an airport. So we are about to get engaged in uh, LA Rams Stadium project. It's a $2.6 billion, uh, which happens to be really close to the airport. And as part of that, they've even had to pay uh, $60 million to relocate one of the telecommunication towers at the airport because of that project. But we've gone through a different process for that. Uh, it takes somewhere between uh, three weeks to three months to get a special permit to operate within the proximity of the um, airport. But um, you know, it's another level of coordination that's happening. Um, you know, we, we remain optimistic that regulations would improve. Uh, biggest challenge that we have is um, you still need to maintain line of sight. A lot of these platforms that we have are autonomous. So you, know, you don't need to control them. But FASC wants somebody to be on the site, make sure that they can actually see it in case of system failure, there won't be any accident. So what it means right now is that we have to have multiple people engaged in the process. Uh, the cost goes up. But hopefully over the next few years, uh, regulation will start relaxing a bit more. More questions? Yes. Yeah, I just want to congratulate you on getting the idea down the pipeline out, out to uh, construction. That's great, especially using all the UI students. Um, my question is, Right now, it's a visual system. Uh, is there any possibility in the future that drones could be modified to do non-destructive testing, for instance, on Japan bridges? Absolutely. That's an excellent question. And thank you for, for your comment. Um, yeah, so let me start by the first part. I'm uh, really proud that I've graduated from here. I had the opportunity of um, taking courses in various departments and working with people across the college, which was a really unique opportunity. And that's one of the reasons I came back. When I graduated from here, I worked at a different university. But when the opportunity um, was provided to me to come back, I did not even hesitate uh, because I knew how much opportunity would be provided to me. So I've been back for about four years now. Um, on the second piece, uh, non-destructive testing, absolutely. Uh, there are colleagues in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering that this is their expertise when it comes to health monitoring of existing infrastructure systems. So we do work with them. There are elements of work that we've done. And hopefully on Monday, we would learn what the requirements of the uh, Ministry of Transport is in Japan, so we can make sure we can fine-tune our solutions for that. 
Um, it takes time to establish guidelines and workflows for using technology on job site. So we've taken baby steps, um, especially with the country of Japan. We've localized the system in Japanese. That was one of the requirements as an example. And um, we've only worked on three bridges that you know, has been paid by them um, to be operated. And hopefully if everything goes well in the next few weeks, we're gonna scale it to close to about 100 bridges as the next phase, and then eventually scaling up to the entire country. Uh, we are working with uh, partners here in the US, uh, mostly railroad track operators that they own bridges. Uh, they're also very concerned with the status of health uh, for their existing uh, bridges. And we can also significantly cut down that cost. But hopefully we can do that within the coming year. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, one question. This might pertain to regulation also. But have you received any feedback from the workers themselves in terms of when they're being monitored, are they aware? Are there any privacy concerns for people being monitored when they're working? That's an excellent question. Absolutely. Um, this is actually one of the reasons I showed one slide on safety and the guideline that we put together. So that guideline requires um, the superintendent on the job site um, to bring uh, this concept of drone operation within the context of coordination. So this gets discussed with every single worker that's going to be part of that operation, and they know when and where the drone would be operated. Typically, we operate it during lunchtime, if it happens to be throughout the day, or we operate it over weekends when there's no worker on the job site. Although, we, you know, we, after probably flying close to about a few hundred times on job sites, we feel very confident that this is always a repeatable task, but we still want to make sure that we have minimal number of workers that are going to be subject. Uh, privacy is absolutely another big piece, but, you know, this notion of videotaping job sites happening around since 1989, so it's not a new concept. The fact that it's being automated now has set an aspect to it. But you know, we work privacy by educating everyone on why and where we do this uh, drone operation. Uh, that's an excellent point. Yes? Um, any uh, estimate of the average um, cost savings on one of these large projects? And do you have to share the profits with the University of Illinois? <clears throat> that's an excellent question. So on the first part, yes. So we've been very fortunate that we worked with Clark Construction and Turner Construction on understanding return on investment that it would make on these type of projects. In one case, we we're very glad that we were able to improve reliability of plan, which is a metric that we use for performance. And we showed that we can improve it by 25%, which was really significant. But this is, uh, that does not immediately mean that you can cut the cost down by 25%. That means uh, there are elements in your plan that you can more reliably establish when you're working on the job site. It's hard to see how much of the impact is purely because we're operating a drone versus the fact that now we are doing a better planning now because we have a workflow. So we are still working on separating these pieces and making sure we can assess return on investment in every single module that we're using because there are so many things that are combined in the system that we have. Um, I think there was a second part to your question that I... Sharing, uh, oh, sharing profits with the university. That's an excellent question. So uh, everything that we've done at the university, uh, we've filed a disclosure with Office of Technology Management. What that does is that it transforms the idea into a patent. The patents are usually licensed out of the university to a startup company. So our startup company, Reconstruct, um, that I have it on top of this slide, uh, happens to be partly owned by the university. So university does have uh, share and equity in the company. Beyond that, when we establish and license a patent, certain part of the money that the company generates beyond the ownership of the company comes back in terms of royalty um, to university. So it's a process that has been established um, uh, with, the, with the support of uh, Professor Singer here, one idea that we were able to establish in um, uh, uh, the, the fellowship program was to make sure we can do this uh, repeatedly over the next few years. So now we have a contract in place with Office of Technology Management. That means specifically for drone on construction projects, every patent that we do goes through the same formulation of licensing, how much money would be owned by the university, what is the formulation for the royalty, things of that nature. But that's been actually a pretty standard process. Other questions? Yes. For uh, a fixed job site, instead of a roaming drone, uh, is anyone using, say, tethered dirigibles? Because I would think that would be cheaper. You wouldn't run a, you wouldn't have skilled labor costs. You wouldn't have uh, FAA regulations to consider and just do, you know, planar scans. That's an excellent question. So the um, question is, can we do a tethered uh, system? Absolutely. It is possible. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we have is, you know, doing a neat, well, being, you know, if you want to make this tethered, you'd likely need to establish a, you know, a structure, infrastructure to be able to support it. 
Um, given the fact that sites are typically often changing over time, it's been hard for us to go through that process. And ironically, you know, we started this from an angle of visual data capture. So initially, drones were, were not involved at all. And the companies that started picking up the idea of uh, using drones. So we just wanted to tap into what they're already happy with, as opposed to introducing a new piece of hardware to it. But absolutely, that's an, um, that's a, that's an idea that we've been uh, considering. But we don't, I don't have any example to show you today on that. But that's a great point. Yes? I'm just uh, curious. I come from a background of doing underwater mapping for bridges and for harbors and then now working with buildings on campus and energy efficiency on campus. But I'm just remembering back to the underwater mapping and how much um, data process, manual data processing there is in, in, in fixing the real-time kinematic or the, the, the GPS antenna would change a little bit from, from spot to spot. How much, how much sort of student or, or manual work is still involved? That's an excellent question. So um, there are you know, three pieces to the analysis of the data. Um, one piece is the data capture process when it comes to operating a drone and whatnot. Um, GPS still happens to be a, uh, you know, um, a technology that happens to be unreliable in certain cases for us. Uh, the other aspect is when we are uh, operating close to steel structures, magnetometers that are you know, on this platform also get affected. So sometimes drone operations happen to be manual. But anyway, given the FAA regulations, we still need to have somebody standing and keeping the line of sight. So we're using somebody's time to manage the drone operation. So sometimes we have to switch back a completely manual operation and we get the data out of it. The analytic part of it, going from images to these reality models is a completely automated process. Bring them into alignment with the plan model is also another completely automated process. Comparing the two is a piece that is not fully automated. It's partly an input by the contractors, so students are not usually involved in that process, or the company is not involved in it. Um, but there are you know, pieces that we are collecting that uh, in the next uh, few years, we can definitely automate it. Uh, the need for the data was out there when we started this work, but you know, with these hundreds of projects that we've done, now we actually have that big data we, that we actually need for, for the purpose of automation. But that's an excellent point. Great. Oh, uh, it was great, and I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I actually have two questions. One is, it seems like uh, you are focusing a lot on the uh, low-cost uh, sensors, like uh, camera, low-cost cameras or even smartphones. And given uh, a lot of the construction is like a billion dollar or like, um, like half a billion dollar projects, have you thought about more expensive uh, sensors, such as LiDAR sensors? That's uh, my second point. question is, have you ever crashed any drones? <laughs> okay, that's an excellent question. So, <laughs> um, so let me uh, start by addressing the first part. And the first question is, um, what about using perhaps a little bit more expensive sensors that can um, capture more reliable data? Let me turn off the audio here. So here's an example of a more expensive type of uh, sensing device, a laser scanner device. There are some construction companies own it. The cost of this device is somewhere between uh, 40 grand to 400 grand um, for the device itself. Uh, the most challenging part is you would be needing a number of people to operate this device on the job site. Typically, we engage two field engineers to walk this around, you need to power, provide the power supply. So usually, the frequency of the capture is smaller compared to other techniques that we have. Now, the second piece of your question is about the cost. If it's a billion dollar project cost, can we afford using more expensive technology? Unfortunately, no, because the margins of profit for construction companies are not large. Most of the money really goes into uh, procuring the material that are needed for the construction project, and labor cost is always really significant for us. So here the opportunity is to minimize administration and management costs as opposed to the actual work itself. Um, this, the last question you have, whether we've crashed the drone, gladly no. We have not done that yet. And I'm very happy that hasn't happened in our site because one accident can actually cause a significant challenge for us. Um, and again, you know, we've been probably involved in um, more than 600, 700 flights so far. Um, but I am aware of cases that this has happened. Uh, and when it has happened, it has increased the insurance liability that the companies have to provide for drone operation. And this is a very volatile market. Um, there, there are a number of startup companies that keep coming up with ways, creating ways that they can establish insurance per flight. Um, so you can actually get uh, you know, caps of $5 million, $10 million now, uh, with just paying a few hundred bucks for the drone operation. Um, but yeah, I mean, accidents is something that you know, we are really concerned with. We are hoping that this would never happen. And gladly enough, it hasn't happened yet. Yes, sir. That's 
That's a great question. So, um, you know, often before starting the operation uh, with these drone operators, we do a walk uh, through on the job site to make an assessment on potential, you know, issues that we're going to have. The example that I showed in Chicago was actually in downtown Chicago. So we we're expecting to have a lot of interference in GPS. And in many cases, the drone operation completely manually operated the drone. But in other cases, I didn't show any project in Texas. We do have a few projects there. And these are really large um, sites. And um, there's no um, buildings adjacent to the site. Um, and we had you know, very good GPS signal. So we didn't have any issue. We've not yet used any other technology to facilitate the process. Actually, Professor Grace here is an, has an expertise in uh, um, using uh, sensors to improve how we do navigation and planning for these uh, platforms. We've not had the opportunity of using them yet. But that's an excellent point. An opportunity for collaboration, Grace. <laughs> um, other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Yes, there okay. Go. So, the, the, the red and the green. So could that be used like if something happened in court for the the construction person to say like, hey, uh, I did what I, you know, was like, is that was that is that a practical use of it? Is basically what I'm asking. It's a great question. So the question is, can this be used um, in the court um, to make a case who was uh, you know behind the schedule and the root causes for performance problems? Absolutely yes. I mean. That's one of the reasons that you see professional image collection happening on the job site, because contractors and owners always want to have a visual recording of what is happening on the job site. Um, you know, instead of thinking about this as a tool that can um, prevent um, legal issues, uh, we've been thinking about this as a tool for improving collaboration so we can minimize the chances of going to the court. Uh, there are a number of creative ways of establishing alternative dispute, dispute resolution techniques on job sites that this actually would be extremely beneficial to them. We want to usually you know, call this a preventive claim management system, a system that would prevent legal issues from happening as opposed to one that would react to it. But absolutely, um, this visual data is actually something great for uh, making the case uh, because there's no way you can actually you know, uh, modify them. It actually shows you the truth. Um, I just wanted you to elaborate a little bit on the difference between um, 3D and 4D images. That's an excellent question. So uh, by 4D, I mean 3D that will be generated over time. When we are flying a drone every week, every week data that gets captured generates one three-dimensional model. But we do this over time. That means every week there's one 3D model. We tie these models automatically together. So by changing your um, you know, a spectrum in time, you can dive from one image that belongs from last week to an image that belongs to the next week of the capture. So it's basically multiple 3D models that are being captured over time, and they're all merged into one as 4D. But that's an excellent point. I think this will probably have to be our last question, just because sure. we're running long on time. It's, uh, it's great to have this I'd love to get more questions. So if we run out of time, I'd be happy to stand here and answer more questions. Please. That's an excellent question. So the question is, can this be used for, for example, storm damage assessment? Absolutely. Um, you know, after um, you know, an incident on the job site, you can definitely fly this around uh, without you know, the chances of exposing uh, your workers to potential safety issues. Um, I want to give you an example. Imagine that you know, there's an area that's been subject to an earthquake, and potentially you've had sudden collapses on the job site. By being able to fly this in that location, you can minimize the possibility that your responders would go into that location, and while they're making the assessment, they will be subject to a safety issue. In fact, um, there has been a number of use cases for drones and also ground robots for that purpose. We did one work with the Japanese in a completely different context a few years ago, where the idea was to deploy a ground robot using a helicopter on a certain site that had safety issues. We wanted to see if we can use the visual sensors on that platform 
for the purpose of assessment. Yes, definitely. But you know, these cases are things that you um, well, hopefully, will never happen on the job site. Um, they're infrequent usually. So for now, we've stayed with the cases that we can frequently offer our analytics, and we can understand how we can improve the technology. But that's an excellent point. So one last quick thing. Uh, we have a, a visitor with us, uh, Vikram Anger, who is the president, uh, director, of outreach. director of outreach for our uh, honor society in electrical and computer engineering, Ada Kapanu. And uh, Vikram has some students here with him outside at, for a little milling around after the talk. And Vikram would like to say a couple of things. Vikram, if you would. So first off, let's give another round of applause to our speaker for today. Thank you. And uh, yeah, after that, so like, uh, as was mentioned, I'm the director of outreach for Ada Kapanu. And as part of a new initiative this semester, uh, we'd like to have some demos following each Saturday Engineering for Everyone session that's related to the topic that was covered uh, during the seminar. So today, uh, on your way out, please make sure to stop by some of our tables outside. And we have some image recognition and facial uh, detection uh, demos um, for you guys to view. And that's an important part of, um, you know, it, like, when we have the drones uh, taking photos and things like that, it's very important that you're able to actually do something with those images. And um, this is just a, a very, very basic demo showing some of the things that you can do. So thank awesome. you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, thanks, Vikram. And thanks again, Manny. What a great talk. Uh, Manny will be yeah. here for a little bit afterwards. Hang around, ask questions. It's great to have you all here. We hope to see you again, <laughs> certainly April 15th. And either the 1st or the 29th, we're, we're working on dates. Uh, please check the website. Uh, please go see uh, Escape Lab, Paul Quiat's uh, new community resource out in Lincoln Square Mall. Thanks for being here. See you next time. Thank you.